All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for today, for the gorgeous day that we have, uh, the cold temperature and uh, the sunshine. I uh, just thank you for your faithfulness towards us. Lord, be with us today as we look at biblical principles of how we can be more effective in uh, reaching our, our lost friends and family members, and just be with us time as we uh, just focus on you in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, for those that may not have been with us, uh, we're looking at lostology, which is really the study of what it means to be spiritually lost, and we're trying to have a better understanding of what that is. For some of us, it may have uh, kind of been grown up, grown up in the church. We may not really have a good, uh, I think, recognition sometimes of what it means to be lost and how we can be more effective in sharing our faith. And so, we're, we've been uh, extracting some principles out of a textbook called "Out of Their Faces and Into Their Shoes," and I know Herschel has gone through a series on lostology uh, a couple years ago. There's some um, YouTube videos and some of those sermons. Did anyone do their assignment and look at some of the YouTubes? John, <laughs> all right, good. Uh, yes, it is. It's very good. So I highly encourage you to do that. I've given you the YouTube uh, addresses on the uh, class syllabus, so I encourage you to go back and look at some of those. So um, there are there, there's more than just Herschel's. Yeah, yeah, it'll he, pull up a lot of different videos. So, but. Uh, but in our case, we're not just listening to a sermon. Hopefully, we're applying what we're learning. And that was kind of the, the intent of the class. Uh, I'll see how you did at the end. But uh, uh, So anyway, we've got three course objectives. One is to uh, really affect our hearts, our effective, and uh, develop um, a passion for reaching the lost, to, to then cognitively to understand the laws, and then to apply them, basically. So we've gone through a few of these. Uh, if you look at your PowerPoint, I kind of summarize those. First week we looked at being lost can be fun. No one gets lost on purpose. It's easy to get lost, and you can be lost in not knowing it. And so we kind of went through a discussion of those. And then last week we looked at uh, these four laws. You cannot force people to admit they are lost. It would try to force a three-year-old to admit something <laughs> that they don't. Tried, yes. yes, you've tried. <laughs> uh, so uh, sometimes adults are like that. Admitting you're lost in the first uh, it is the first step in the right direction. When you're lost, you're out of control, and just because you're lost does not mean you're stupid. So we we looked at those in detail, and today we're looking at four additional or losses. Uh, laws. Um, it's tough to trust a stranger. People ask for directions without revealing their true emotions. Directions are always confusing, and unnecessary details can sometimes make our instructions more confusing. So I've given each of you all a different law to kind of work on, as we've done the last couple of weeks. So take a few minutes to kind of look at some of those questions, and then we'll get back together. We will uh, we'll discuss those and uh, see what you all think about that. All right, looks like everyone's just about done, so let's go ahead and start walking through some of these questions. So law nine is it's tough to trust a stranger. So um, Camp uses a uh, story from John about the uh, woman at the well when Jesus comes up to talk to her. Uh, Jesus is obviously a stranger to her. Uh, she's a stranger to him, and then subsequently... Uh, he shares the gospel with her. She runs into town, gets all of her friends, and brings them out to meet a stranger that they had not met, obviously. But uh, uh, so we're going to look at that dynamic of that that event and ask a few questions. Um, so, what do you think caused the town people to come out and meet a stranger? She was already kind of an outcast from the community. It's kind of somewhat paradoxical that. They would listen to her and then come running out to meet Jesus, who was a Jew, and they were they were uh, what? No, I mean, what culture were the people? They were Samaritans, right? So, Jews and Samaritans didn't get along, obviously. So, um, 
So what do you think uh, caused them to come out and do that? You ever thought about that? Okay, they obviously knew something about this woman's life, right? So they could have been motivated. Well, this is what would get this woman. She's had a rough life to be so excited about something. Uh, I mean, there's several things we could drill down and start thinking about, uh, what, which is true. A lot of stories in, in, the, in the Bible, a lot of times we just gloss over the, the, the basic facts without really thinking behind the story, what's going on. Uh, so kind of applying that to ourselves, if, if we're put in the position of the woman, what strategy have you used to build relationships with non-Christians? If you came and told them, uh, I met this Jesus guy, he's you know, changed my life, he knew things about me. Do you have anybody that you could go tell that story to, number one? And number two, what kind of reaction would they have? Okay, that's good. Uh, what have you done to introduce your non-Christian friends to other Christians? She obviously went and introduced her non-Christian friends to Jesus. Okay. Uh, what have we done to build relationships with our non-Christian friends and maybe start to build relationships with Christian friends to provide a network of support or, or a team effort? Okay. Okay. Right. Do you ever get a verbal reaction to that? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully it stimulates the thought that we need to maybe be a little more proactive and think about strategically things we can be doing, right? Uh, so the next question is, this, since many non-Christians do not have close friends who are Christians, who will they talk to when they're searching for spiritual answers? Non-Christians probably, right? Yeah. Right. Right. So it's unlikely they're going to have anyone to talk to. Well, I'm sure they'll have people to talk to. Yeah, exactly. They'll get all kinds of answers, right? Um, I hear all kinds of spiritual perspectives at UK, you can imagine. But um, uh, Do you know a non-Christian who came as a total stranger to our church? Why did they come and what, what happened? Anybody know anybody who just walked off the street without any personal contact? Anyone here? Okay. No one probably jumps to our minds, right? Which what does that imply? What's kind of necessary? Okay, we need to be kind of inviting people. Okay, so why do you think it's important for Christians to work together to build relationships with non-Christians? What, in other words, is is it going to be more effective as we work as a team versus an individual? Well, I think it's a slow process. A lot of times, it's a slow process. Uh huh. Okay. Has anyone strategically worked with people like in your care group or whatever to essentially uh, pray for a specific person and come up with some practical ways to kind of reach out to that person as a as a team, so to speak? Okay. All right. That's good, Seth. Uh, so what are some specific strategies that anyone's come up with to do that, to build bridges to other people? John, you mentioned uh, the community group is one vehicle potentially, right? Right. Okay, uh, that's good. 
So there's a mutual benefit to that person. He may come learn something that he can actually apply in his own professional life or whatever, but then there's opportunity to develop relationships with Christians, okay? Uh, sometimes I think we, we lack a lot of imagination on, on reaching people, right? We kind of get in our comfortable uh, communities, and it's like you say, well, I've got non-Christian colleagues at work, but, you know, my church life, my family life is kind of insulated, and I'm not really building any bridges there, okay? Okay. All right, so what's some uh, ways we could apply uh, this lesson this coming week? What's a practical thing, one thing you could do? That's a, that's a good good comment, yeah. Certainly today, yeah. We drive into our uh, homes, we open the, the uh, garage door, zip in, shut it down, and go into our house, right? No one sees us or... Okay. Uh, right. Okay, good. Uh, we could probably spend a lesson on each of these, these laws, but uh, let's touch on a few others. Law 10 was people ask for directions without revealing their true emotions. And I've got some examples here. You think of Nicodemus coming to Jesus. You think of the woman of the well we just referenced in law number 9. And go back and dissect some of the questions she was asking Jesus. It was obviously there was a spiritual need there, but she was kind of uh, sabot or not uh, not sabotaging, but kind of counterfaging those. Um, so it says, uh, Cramp suggests we always be attentive to the following spiritual signals. Uh, he says, when someone asks you a spiritual question, when someone shows up at your church, when someone mentions they've tried to read a Bible, when someone mentions a spiritually motive or related movie or TV program, when someone attends a Christian fellowship event, uh, when those things happen, we need to be on. It's like Dennis says, we need to have our kind of radar turned on to be listening for those types of things uh, as an indication the Holy Spirit may be working in their life to, to try to uh, uh, change their heart. Uh, so why do you think Christians may be prone to miss much uh, or per, miss so much signals like that, like Dennis was just talking about. We don't hear. Okay. Yeah, well, when someone kind of interrupts our schedule that may be seeking something, do we look at that as an opportunity or as an annoyance? If we're honest. It's like, oh, I can't believe this part. I've got stuff to do, you know. Did Jesus treat people that way? Think about it. He, he had an agenda. He was going places, and what happened? He'd, he'd constantly be interrupted. What did Jesus do? Did he say, I'm sorry, but I'm busy. I've got to go, you know, to Jericho or to Nazareth. Or... Yeah. He was constantly pivoting to the extent you can imagine the disciples are getting frustrated. It's like, hey, we got to go. You know, this, this person will be okay. we we got to go to the next thing. Okay, so... Just think about that, the way we sometimes we think and react. Um, so relative to the signals I just mentioned, it says, which one of those have you ever encountered? Uh, has anybody ever encountered someone that has demonstrated those type of verbal or nonverbal signals? Any examples? Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes God brings people to us to help us acknowledge we're not fully equipped, we need to depend on him, right? Or, or a network of people causes us to be more dependent upon Christ because we're not going to, quote-unquote, convert people on our own anyway. Right? We can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can really do that. But then it's like what you were saying. I was like, okay, she comes, when he comes into your office, how do you get rid of it? And I'm like, oh, I have all this stuff, and she'll just come back and realize that I'm nice and will listen and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Krista, ultimately we all have to ask ourselves, what is our real job? Why are we here on this planet? Okay. Right. It's very easy to get sucked into the world's mentality, I think, isn't it? I 
I think, yeah, it's what Dennis was saying, right? We, right, because that, that's going to cost me something. Right. But, but again, maybe God is trying to force you to, to become uncomfortable to open up other doors or resources that you're not accessing, okay? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Until it happens, right? <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's another thing. Are we praying daily, God, bring someone to my life today with questions or problems? Or are we praying, God, please don't bring anyone to my life today with questions or problems? Yeah. Well, you think of Martha and Mary. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you ever missed a signal and then you recognize later on that you probably missed a signal there? So whenever, does that happen to anyone? Uh, I remember we had this one guy at work that was a total mess. He was an alcoholic. He was working uh, somewhat under me. He was very volatile. Uh, we'd be in meetings. He'd just blow up and yell at everyone and storm out. And and if there's anyone I thought could be reached for Christ, that guy was the least likely. Um, and then he had some challenges. And then... Uh, was was in a rehab facility for a couple months and then came back and met me and apologized for his past behavior, said he had been saved and was just uh, exuberant about his relationship with Christ and everything. And I thought, man, I had an opportunity there and I just like, this guy's a mess, I'm not going to deal with him. Right? Uh, think about the blessings we're missing by not stepping out and trusting the Lord. Uh, with our time. He did because he approached me afterwards. But but again, I could have been uh I could have been more forthright and uh spoken up, I think. So uh but you're right. But but it's not just the opportunities we miss, it's the blessings we miss. Okay. I mean if the angels in heaven are rejoicing at the salvation of one person, think about what joy is available to us if we just allow God to use us in that way. Um, last question there says, why do you think uh, many Christians' churches fail to catch the significance of questions and other signals that seekers keep, give? What, we, what can we do to raise the sensitivity of these Christians to seekers around them? Well, I think I think the most compelling thing to a non-believer, quite frankly, John, is your own personal testimony, and I don't mean by that, uh, you know, this was I was a terrible person and I became saved. Your your personal testimony, how God is working in your life right now, that's what people really are wanting to hear. They want to hear that your faith is real and that it actually impacts your life in a daily manner, right? So. You can always pivot on some experience that you've gone through that's similar to theirs and at least provide, provide a bridge of empathy. Uh, I think sometimes we think we, we have to get caught up in the mechanics, if I can say that, of, of you know a series of verses or something we have to memorize and say to try to get uh, some type of person to sign their name on a contract or something, like we're a salesperson. We're really not. We're supposed to be reflecting uh, the gospel of, of Christ, right? Which, which is not really contractual in, in that sense. It's a relationship. And so I think you can just respond back. People, people are not expecting you to be some perfect person. And if you portray yourself as I've got the answer and I've got to roll out these scriptures, that's just going to push people away. They're going to say, this person doesn't have a clue what I'm going through or understand that so um, I mean at some point when people reach the point they ask you well, what do I have to do to become a Christian I think that's when you can pivot with the gospel but I don't think that's where you start right I think you start with just demonstrating a, a, a 
a desire to understand them and, and love them. Yes, Dennis. Right. Well, you also sounds like you're putting pressure on yourself to have this all perfectly, and I'm, and that's become a barrier to saying anything, right? And and that becomes counterproductive. And I don't think that's what Christ is expecting. All right. I guess the guy with his hands is optimistic. Well, you're assuming that. Okay. If Christ is sovereignly working, he's going to arrange that. Right? So, uh, I mean, I recognize we need to be ready to give a response like Peter talks about, but sometimes I think we get, we worry about the mechanics of sharing our faith instead of the relational element. And I think the, the latter is probably more important. So. Well, that's why it's also important to build teams like I talked about, right? Okay. All right, so Law 11. Uh, let's see, who had Law 11 to look at? Stephen? Okay. Uh, what's that? Yeah, Stephen and Dennis. <laughs> Doug, did you, did you have? No, you had number nine, I think. All right, so this one says, distract or directions are always confusing. Uh, I love this uh, road sign here. Is that confusing? <laughs> Just a little bit. Which lane am I in? Okay. Uh, anyone ever get in the wrong lane and you get up at the intersection? I'm in the wrong lane. Okay. So uh, so sometimes our directions can be uh, confusing. It says, here's some suggestions. Um, don't assume seekers know anything about the Bible or spiritual principles. Don't use religious cliches or obscure theological terms. Uh, provide people pictures, analogies, and illustrations to explain spiritual truths. I found that very effective. Uh, take time to answer questions. Don't overwhelm with information. Learn to develop what are called two-minute drills. Does everybody know what a two-minute drill is in football? What is that? So you have to have an offense that can score in that minute of time, right? So... Um, Sometimes we try to think of all these details. Here's an example I've seen uh, on just the nature of God. Someone's asking, well, what is God like? It's got like three things God is without. He's without beginning, without end, without change. Three things God is. God is Trinity, which is a source of unity and diversity in the universe. God is holy. This is bad news for everyone that is not holy. God is love. This is good news for believers or those that believe. Just some simple, basic concepts. And then... Uh, you can have scriptures to go with those of those ask, well, where do you get that idea or whatever, right? Uh, and you can take that from any any question you can think of that you might be asked, just break down into condensed responses. Um, here's another question. Think of a time when, uh, time it should be when you tried to talk to a non-Christian about your faith, try to remember what you said and how the lost person responded uh, do, you, do you think the person found your uh, spiritual directions clear or confusing? All right, just think about in the future then, are there some things we can do that might simplify or make things easier for people to understand? What type of terminology may we uh, might want to avoid? Churchies, okay. Are you saved? What does that mean, right? What's that? Don't even know what sin is, right? Or, or they they reject the concept of sin. Uh, sin is everything everyone else does that's bad, but I don't do that. Okay. Uh that's why I found like like uh, can't mention. Sometimes you can use analogies. Just come up with good analogies. Think about Jesus. He was constantly using parables, things that people could relate to, and then they could draw a spiritual application out of that. Uh, sometimes we need to. Be okay. Yeah, I remember we went through EE. E. Had a lot of very good illustrations that were useful. I think. Uh, all right, any other things you can glean from Lesson 11? Anything we could put into practice? Right. 
Yeah, so on the, the converse of that is a lot of lost people have certain preconceptions about us that are not accurate too, right? That we have to be sensitive recognizing this is what they're thinking. Right. Play, that's right. Those are two things that are banned in my home. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, number 12, the last one. Unnecessary details make directions more confusing. Here's some examples, I think, where Jesus tried to make things as simple as possible. He talks about a narrow gate and a wide gate. He talked about uh, what a lot of people, when they think about the gospel, they use John 3.16 as a very straightforward uh, way to do that. Uh, just think about how did Jesus try to keep things simple or, or kept things simple? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has anyone been to a foreign country where they have a foreign language? How did you feel in that environment? And you can't ask, you can't even hardly, you can't ask directions, right? I remember I was in Germany uh, several summers when I was a kid, and it's like I knew no German. And it just, I felt like a total idiot, right? And I would be embarrassed to go talk. Well, I couldn't talk to people. They just look at you like you're an idiot. So, but, uh, so you just think about how other people may feel from a spiritual standpoint where they feel like they have no real background. So, again, that's why the title of the book is, is, you know, out of their faces and into their shoes, trying to think about things from their perspective. So, uh, here's some suggestions that Cramp gives. Listen as much as you talk. By listening, you earn the right to talk. By understanding, you earn the right to be understood. Ask questions to ensure you're being understood. This goes back to what John was just talking about. Do not talk for an extended period of time without stopping to see if your friend has questions. You ever do that? Start talking to someone and you just keep going and then you realize they haven't understood anything I've been talking about. Okay. Sometimes that happens to me all the time in class, right? <laughs> it's like... Certainly when I give the exam, it's like, they didn't understand anything I was saying. So, but, uh, but sometimes people are intimidated to ask questions. Um, so getting back to what you were talking about, John says, use parts of, of your memorized presentation to respond to specific questions that they ask as opposed to just giving that information out. Uh, avoid sharing your ideas in a manner that sounds like a canned sales speech. Uh, do, do, do most people like to uh, deal with sales paper, salespeople? I hate dealing with salespeople. Susan loves dealing with salespeople, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just I can't stand them. Anyway, um, what's that? I'm sorry, Doug. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's just car salesman maybe it's a specific type I just want to come in I know what I want to buy this is the car this is how much I want to pay for don't I don't want to sit in your office for an hour where you go back and forth with the manager and they come back and tell me that well I've got this great deal I've worked out with the manager blah 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 it's just okay yeah that's right I I just sent Susan in she's my secret weapon so but uh yeah exactly so um, so when you talk with non-Christians about Christ, do you tend to say too much or too little? What do you think? Too much? Of course, we're not sharing anything. We're, not say, we're saying too little, right? Um, can you think of a time when you said too much? Okay. So what, what maybe are some simple things we could do to make our message a little more coherent and not confusing, do you think? Have you ever just stopped down and thought maybe a few things you could communicate, kind of write those down, and then share that with another brother or sister of Christ and say, how do you think you might react if you heard this question or... Uh, I found one of the nice things about Evangelism Explosion, which was a program years ago, is you, you would dialogue with people and, and kind of get some experience, sort of a hands-on experience of seeing what that feels like and, and uh, going through that, uh, which I don't think we probably do uh, 
enough hands-on kind of training. We, we do a lot of contextual information we give folks in churches, but I don't think we, we actually do some good hands-on training. I mean, it's like, it's like telling a plumber, okay, um, okay, this is how you fix this, and then you never show them how you actually do that, okay? That's not going to be very effective, is it? So why, why do we think we'd be effective evangelism? Did Jesus show the disciples how to witness? Okay. Exactly. He just didn't tell them how to witness, did he? Okay. How was that very effective? Uh, you know, I remember the old evangelism explosion. There were questions. There were two of those. You know, one is uh, uh, basically what's going to happen when you die, where you go to heaven or not, and then... When they if they say yes or no, typically they say yes, and then it's like, well, what would you say to God when you got to heaven? And then, yeah, exactly. And then based on their responses, that would give you some insights of how to pivot and go. I think most people today that those questions are not real effective, at least not with people under forty years old. That that you've you've got almost step back another step it's like you know do you believe in spiritual things or do you believe in god or just establish a baseline of understanding uh, most people have just blocked out the concept well, in the in the old times I, i'll use that in quotes right people believed in heaven and hell they may have recognized that that they're living a life that maybe not going to take them there but they just stayed busy now people don't even believe in hell okay so when you, if you ask them a question, are you going to heaven or hell? They says, well, I don't believe in heaven. Or I don't believe in hell. Okay, that's kind of a, a non-starter if you start there. So another question I would step back and say, uh, well, if they've asked you questions, then you can kind of start building off that. But, but uh, you know, do you believe in, uh, what's, what's your spiritual background? Uh or what do you think about spiritual things or a spiritual reality? A lot of people have a spiritual belief. They just don't believe in heaven or hell or something like that. And you can kind of start to unravel from that. Uh, when it gets to the issue of morality, I think, again, there's some questions you can start asking that people, most people don't think through the, the ramifications of their own assumptions. And by simply asking questions, they can kind of internally start to see the inconsistency of their answers. And then that provides a, an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to start convicting them, I think. So uh, in that case, you just kind of let people start answering questions like John said. And I can go through some of those uh, or give you some really good resources for that that I think are more effective, at least in dealing with this generation. Uh, so, But that's a great question, so that's how I would approach that. Uh, so we've got uh, the questions we went through today. Um, next next week we're going to be looking at four more love pays whatever a search costs, which gets back to our time. Uh, a search becomes your consuming priority. So we kind of be talking about a little issues related to understanding the loss, but what about now our motivation for doing that? A search is always loss centered, not search centered. It gets back to our time again, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, a search is urgent because the lost are in danger. You know, we talk about, do, do, what about people think about heaven and hell? I think we have a lot of Christians that don't, they say they believe in heaven and hell, but I don't think their behavior acts like it, right? Yeah, I, I'm going to have fun while I can, and yeah, exactly. Right. Well, there are actually cultures like that. I've talked to some Indian colleagues uh, that are professors at a university, they said, in our culture, we don't think about spiritual things till we're after 60. We, we, our whole lives are structured, you know, we, uh, when we're growing up, we just think about education, getting the credentials to go to college, then we think about work, then we think about family, and then once all that's over, then we start to think about spiritual things. I get that presumes something that, that they're going to live that long, right? But um, so I think most people tend to do that. We're honest. Any other final thoughts or comments or insights? I don't think that's going to be effective with millennials or Generation Z. Just to be honest, there are, I think there are more effective questions you can ask. Uh, 
And I'll try to touch on that the last lesson. We have a little more. But uh, again, a lot of people don't believe in heaven. They don't want there to be a heaven. Because if there's a heaven, there's probably some responsibility associated with that. There might be a hell as well, right? So, uh, but anyway. Okay, well, let's close with a word of prayer. I don't want to keep you from missing service. Dear guys, thank you for this time together we've had. Thank you for the insights that we've cleaned from looking at uh, your word and examples of how you interacted with lost people. Uh, God, help us to be more sensitive to uh, the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Uh, help us have the courage and faith to step out and put ourselves out there to be available to listen to people and to be responsive to their needs. Help us to be more strategic in our time and our efforts relative to... Um, putting together uh, specific strategies to reach those around us, God. Uh, just help us to remember our one that we've committed to praying for and trying to reach and help us to be more uh, committed in pursuing that goal. We just ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.